Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is John Bickerton. Um, I'll be chairing this uh, lunchtime webinar. Um, I am the, I'm no longer the immediate past chair. I am a past chair now of the uh, IMAC E's automobile division. Um, and for my day job, I lead the zero emission fleet strategy for Arriva buses in the UK. Um, really pleased to be uh, here today with Aaron Mandalia, and we're looking forward to hearing what he has to tell us about the uh, General Safety Regulation 2 and the impact that will have on, on our uh, ADAS systems. Um, Aaron has a distinguished career. Um, he started his career with Arriva buses, I'm pleased to say, um, and since moved on through SAIC at Longbridge, through Jaguar Land Rover, and now works with Hariba Myra. Um, so very much a, a subject matter expert, and I'm really looking forward to his presentation. There will be time for question and answer at the end, so you should be able to see a chat bar. Please throw your questions into the chat bar during the presentation and afterwards, um, and I'll pick out the ones that we have time to answer. Um, and we should run for about an hour, so we've got about half an hour of presentation from uh, Aaron, and then we'll have half an hour for questions at the end, and I aim to finish on time. If I don't finish on time, feel free to leave at the appropriate point for yourselves for this lunchtime webinar. Um, thank you very much. I think without further ado, uh, we will uh, hand over to Aaron. Thank you for the introduction. Um, so I'll dive straight into the, the slides. Um, in terms of an agenda and what I will be going through in, in this presentation, um, so we'll start with an overview of um, General Safety Regulation 2, um, cover some of the ADAS features that are included uh, and, and focus on the ones that are included for M1, M1 and heavy commercial vehicle categories. Um, then touch upon some of the challenges for OEM, so these are the key challenges being faced um, as a result of, of GSR2. And also look at some of the industry trends that, that be emerging, regulatory trends, uh, and also VMV um, trends, uh, and an example of to show that how to show how these um, how these trends are being brought into GSR2 to give some early experience um, before they go more widespread. And finally, touching on the impact of on NCAP of GSR2 because when ADAS features become mandated where previously you scored NCAP points for them. Um, it, it has some implications on the NCAP scoring system. So to start off with what is General Safety Regulation 2? Um, it's an umbrella term for a group of UNEC regulations that are split into six categories um, covering restraint systems and crash testing uh, all the way through to general vehicle construction and driver system behavior. So the ones that we're going to focus on today are the ones that, that are predominantly ADAS features, so ones that involve run, vulnerable road users, vision and visibility, and also driver and system behavior. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, focusing on M1, N1 category vehicles and also heavy commercial vehicles. Um, in terms of timing, phase one is due to be implemented in July 2022, so not, not in the too distant future. Um, and that's for new vehicle types. There's a two year grace period for all vehicle types to, to catch up. Um, and then in July 2024, phase two is introduced at which point existing vehicle types must now be compliant with phase one. And in July 2026, existing vehicle types will also need to be compliant with phase two. Um, the important thing to note about GSR2 is that it's uh, you, you need to be compliant to gain type approval for your vehicle. Now, touching on some of the systems, um, starting with M1 and N1 category vehicles, uh, there's features such as emergency stop uh, signal, uh, lane keeping systems, driver drowsiness and attention warning, which is the example that I'll uh, delve into more detail in later, um, emergency braking systems, uh, intelligent speed assist, which combines um, a, a speed, a speed limit display and speed limit information features in with uh, control features, whether that be um, utilizing a haptic pedal to give the driver a nudge when they're approaching or resting at the speed limit or physically limiting the vehicle speed. Um, 
obviously the, the the limiting of the vehicle speed is overridable so so the driver is able to to exceed the speed limit if they they deem it necessary or or for example if the um if the the speed limit information is wrong in the, on that particular occasion um there's also reverse detection uh, systems which is aligned with FMVSS 111 uh, event data recorder and driver availability monitor um touching on driver availability monitor in a bit more detail that's designed for when you have a highly automated system um and to ensure that the, the driver is is ready to to take control when when necessary um so uh, something like a, an SAE level 3 um highway pilot type system um moving into phase 2 uh the, there'll be an introduction of AEB for cyclists and pedestrians um also an advanced driver and distraction warning which is an enhancement of the driver drowsiness and attention warning where it actively monitors the the driver um using a camera for example rather than inferring the driver behavior like the previous system uh, and there will also be a requirement for uh, uh, lane keeping systems for vehicles equipped with hydraulic power assisted steering um that the phase one implementation is for if you have um, an electric electrically assisted power system power steering system moving on to commercial vehicles um you'll, you'll notice that, that some of the, the features are are the same uh, so emergency stop signal for example and the driver drowsiness and tension warning there's also a requirement for alcohol alco uh, sorry alcohol interlock uh, installation facilitation um tire pressure monitoring systems again intelligent speed assistance is the same uh, as is reverse detection um and then moving into pedestrian cyclist collision warning and also blind blind spot information systems so these replace the lane keeping systems um that, that were seen uh, for m1 and n1 vehicles again for 2026 uh, 2024 sorry there is a, a requirement for the advanced driver distraction warning um and then whereas in m1 and m1 category vehicles event data recorder was in phase one for commercial vehicles uh, that event data recorder it is actually applicable from 2026 uh, onwards moving on to some of the challenges so one of the the big ones is that there's much more complex uh, ee architectures within vehicles especially where these systems haven't been fitted previously um uh, and one of the things that that happens if you don't have haven't had uh, any of these systems before is that you've now got to introduce sensors um which need to be uh factored into the existing architecture if it's uh, for, if you're adapting an existing uh, type vehicle um there is also an aspect of increased sensor complexity where systems need to be more um robust and therefore you need more sensors uh, to to meet compliance um so you need to then factor the sensors building the sensors in and also the ecu functions uh, across all vehicle lines um this is an interesting one in the case of um in certain vehicles across vehicle lines there's different specifications so in a base vehicle line you may not have these systems whereas in a, a higher spec uh, line you you may um so what you're having to do is introduce some of the functionality that was previously high spec on high spec vehicles uh, down the chain also as you introduce more different types of sensors um and you want them to work together there's an increased complexity in fusion logic um that that you'll need to implement into your system um however there is also an opportunity here which comes in consolidating architecture design um and finding efficiencies so that if you've got a base set of hardware that you can use across all um different levels of spec of vehicle you can vary the the sort of software package um and some of the sensor suite to make smaller tweaks rather than having distinct uh, levels of capability across different vehicle lines obviously to take advantage of this um 
it, it, it helps if you're developing a whole new architecture because you can consider all of these efficiencies at that point. Um, it, it's much more difficult to, to implement the, or to consolidate when you're trying to build on existing architectures and tweak existing architectures. Also, as features are being adapted and changed to meet the regulations and the requirements, um, you're changing that some of the behavior of the system that means you then need to re-analyze the uh, some of your work in terms of functional safety um, so as your systems become more complex so does your functional safety analysis process because there's a lot more factors that you need to consider um, but also even if they they aren't becoming more complex necessarily, you still need to readdress the the work products because you're making changes to the system. So these work products then need to be updated to reflect the the new system behaviour, um, and that's a, a driver of additional work uh, that needs to be done um, given the short time frame that that we're working to for GSR two. Um, and one of the, the final points on, on the, the functional safety area is that as features become more advanced, we need to start thinking of misuse cases in terms of um, how how drivers can misuse, misuse the system, um, e even though it may not be intended to, to function in a, a certain way. Um, there, there, there are areas in which drivers can exploit the system and therefore potentially introduce unsafe scenarios so that's where we need to, to consider SOTIF as the level of complexity um, increases to ensure that the, the drivers are safe um, whilst they're using these systems and it's difficult for them to, to misuse or, or all those misuses are, are treated in the appropriate manner. And in terms of ADAS testing needs um, these GSR2 is introducing an updated test methodology. Um, so you'll already have uh, test plans for your existing systems. However, because GSR2 may be tested in a slightly different way in terms of the, the sign-off tests, you'll want to ensure compliance um, and also ensure compliance where systems have been changed so that you're meeting the new requirements. So there's an increased level of or there's a revisit to the um, your test planning that's required to ensure that one you can be confident that you've got you achieve compliance but also um, to, to revisit to make sure that your test program is still applicable and appropriate for the uh, changes to the system that you've implemented as we start increasing complexity of systems um, we also should start considering simulation as a uh, a part of the validation process. Um, at the moment, it, it's fairly commonplace for simulation to be used as part of the design process, but bringing it into validation does uh, allow us to achieve some efficiencies. Also, a final one uh, on the, the complexity of testing in terms of uh, ADAS features. When you introduce a new, a, a new regulation, there's always a risk that systems can become designed to pass test protocol rather than prioritizing the, the real world performance, especially with GSR2, where the test protocol is being introduced fairly late into the process. Um, it, it means that you're at risk of driving change into the system purely to satisfy the, the, the test criteria, um, rather than actually taking a step back and understanding what that impact of performance has on uh, on the real world performance of the car. Uh, and the final challenge that I'm going to touch on today is in terms of certification and homologation. So with this being a new regulation and a new process, there's um, a, a whole new planning and approval process that we need to understand and take into consideration. So it, it will be similar to some of the um, some of the other type of approval witness testing that has to be done, but at the same time, um, we, we, we've not run through these specific um, regulations before and the test protocol required as well as the documentation packages. So that needs planning and, and a, 
and understanding to ensure that you're compliant at the point where you go to submit your final documentation. There's also an increased level of testing that's required to gain type approval, um, be that in your pre-tests or in your development testing to ensure that you're compliant or give you confidence that you'll be compliant, but also in witness testing when you do get to that, that stage uh, at the end to get type approval. And alongside this, there's also an increase in new documentation that we need to manage and plan for um, to ensure that by the time you get to the point of being ready for engineering sign-off and homologation, you're in a position where you can be confident that the test will be passed, that the documentation will be created um, and submitted and approved. So I'll move on to some of the industry trends, starting with uh, standards and regulation. In the in the middle of the uh, in the middle of the slide, you can see some of the, the regulations and the standards that are in place. Um, things like ALKS um, and SOTIF as a standard, but also new um, emerging ones from VMAD uh, in the new te assessment test methodology. In terms of levels of automation increasing, so does the number of test cases because you've got more uh, more functionality to test and more interactions between different levels of functionality. Um, so that means there's a, a broader scope of things that need to be tested. But what the critical question here is, when do you stop? Because you could keep going forever. It would be highly inefficient. So at what point can you be confident that you have done enough testing uh, and, and valid to be comfortable in the, the the system that you're releasing. This is where sort of scenario-based processes come into effect, um, and, and for that you require a robust systems engineering approach. Um, and then we move on to looking at how you test. So currently there is a, a trend for physical testing in terms of, or historically there's been a trend for physical testing, um, in terms of you proving ground, test scenarios on the proving ground, and also test um, scenarios and, or, you know, go test your products on the real world, uh, on the real roads. Um, what we are starting to move towards is a, a stronger shift towards simulation. Um, as we said, as test cases go up, it's inefficient to run that number of scenarios um, on the real world. So if we move to a simulation-based uh, method, we can test a wide variety of, uh, of test cases in a, in a short amount of time, um, but we do also still need the physical testing to be done as well. Um, one, to give confidence in the simulation, um, but, but two, to also ensure that you get real world performance as well. So taking that a step further, um, there, there's a, a, a trend towards using a multi-pillar VMV approach. Um, uh, and with this, we want to take simulation, um, start with simulation and bring that into the real world um, and use a mixed approach, um, which is where the, the benefit will lie. So one of the, the elements of this uh, that's going to be key is using uh, hardware in the loop and vehicle in the loop testing uh, in the middle um, between your simulation and your, your physical validation and real world testing um, to really give that full picture through the whole test plan. Um, one of the, the things to note and what, what the whole concept is driving towards is optimizing test plans um, and utilizing scenario-based testing across these different test methods to drive those optimized test plans. Um, the, the sort of pictorial on the graph is to show that no two functions are the same in terms of the balance they will need between simulation um, and physical testing. Um, some you may find you, you, you can do the majority of, of the testing in simulation and then some uh, some sort of final activity in, in the physical test methods. Um, 
whereas in others you may find that simulation is more difficult to achieve uh, to do uh, and therefore you do the majority in the physical but the <clears throat> important thing is to correlate between the two to give you confidence that your simulate the results that you've achieved from simulation are representative of how the physical system behaves and finally and th th this is a trend that will be driven by gsr2 um, compliance alone is no longer enough um, as features become more complex and visible to the end user we need to focus on pushing for real world performance delivery so rather than just meeting the the bare minimum we uh, to, to achieve compliance what we should be doing is making sure that we've got a, a robust feature that, that that drivers will want to use um, so the traditional approach would be conduct a gap analysis uh, to, to understand where we are at the moment and where we need to be in terms of compliance with the regulation and then you've got two options at that point which one is to produce a plan to meet the compliance requirements or you can take that and also have a, another input of understanding what the market expectations are um, and utilize some feedback that you have from customers about your existing systems to improve them further um, whilst also ensuring that you're compliant because because that's the uh, the, the key element of, of the changes that you're making but there should be a focus on making sure that you're improving or at least maintaining the same level of performance rather than hampering that in the name of, of getting your feature to be compliant so some of the benefits of going beyond the compliance only approach um, it allows you to have more opportunity to be right first time which then enables you to avoid sort of late uh, rework um, in, in your system development so if, if you then drive the car on the on the real on the in the real world um, notice that the, the performance isn't acceptable it's going to cost uh, a lot more money to make changes at that point whereas if you had that that mindset previously of being compliant but also maximizing real world performance um, there, there's less of a risk of you of, of you um, encountering that you're also likely to get high performance high real world performance um, and then the benefits that come with that are drivers prefer the, the like the feature more and um, they may also prefer your brand which could drive some brand loyalty and, and increase sales um, moving to, to the the bottom right of that diagram so you can reduce your overall development costs with what we discussed uh, initially in terms of the reducing the level of late rework um, but also benefit from the um, the increased sales from increased brand loyalty and, and a preference for your systems especially when they're mandated onto a vehicle um, another benefit is because you've gone to a, another level of detail you've got an opportunity to have more robust safety cases um, and demonstrate these and also use an increased amount of, of simulation um, to give you that robust safety case so use this as an opportunity to, to learn about that the, the um, simulation aspect where it's a system that you're already familiar with um, <clears throat> but you um, can take this opportunity to start embedding some of the multi-pillar approach in terms of the example that I was going to give so this is um, driver drowsiness and attention warning as an overview of the system um, it's designed to infer the driver driver's level of drowsiness through their steering inputs um, and what it does is monitor the steering inputs um, uh, 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 maybe inputs from other sources if that's how your system is designed um, and assesses the driver against the Karolinska sleepiness scale which is a scale from ranging between uh, a level of one to nine which is a uh, widely adopted across multiple industries um, to rate the level of, of, of drowsiness someone is displaying or feeling and um, what the system will do is once it determines the driver to be um, at a level above a seven or an eight depending on how you, you you've set the requirements um, for your system 
it'll provide a warning uh, to the driver to, to let them know they're drowsy and perhaps advise them to take a break. Moving on to the validation methods within the regulation for this system, um, you can validate either in uh, simulation or in the real world. Um, the key here is that you need a minimum of 10 drivers, whether that you're validating in simulation or the real world, um, to be either sat in a simulator and driving a car, or on a uh, in, in, in on a physical proving ground, or or perhaps the uh, uh, roads, um, public roads, um, and that they will, will drive and rate themselves against the the, the KSS scale um, until they give consecutive readings of above seven or eight. Um, now, the the risk of doing this on public roads is obviously you're um, asking drivers to to, to drive a vehicle for a prolonged period of time until they themselves have deemed themselves to be at a level of drowsiness, um, which is where if we recommend using a physical uh, a proven ground and a controlled environment to conduct this testing um, because it's safe and you can have, um, you're aware of the, the surroundings and the safety driver can quite happily take control of the vehicle um, by reaching over the steering wheel and, and maybe using some dual controls or, or something along those lines without the risk of there being external traffic to interfere. Now, the, the simulation aspect um, requires the same ten, or 10 drivers to be put into a, a simulator and to drive a vehicle in a simulator and again, rate themselves on the, the, the KSS scale. The difficulty with the, the simulation is that we don't know how reliable um, those results will be and how reflective they'll be of the real world, um, which is where we think there's an opportunity to gain experience using the multi-pillar test approach. Um, so doing some of your testing within the, the, the within a physical environment, so the proving ground, um, and also replicating that testing perhaps with the same drivers or different drivers in simulation or in the simulator um, and, and correlating those results to see whether you get the same level of, of accuracy. So this is an opportunity to gain experience in utilizing this multi-pillar test approach um, by doing some result, some testing in simulation, some physical testing and correlating and comparing the results, see if you've got confidence in your simulation. But in a much less complex system where it's not critical because you could do all of your testing in the, uh, physically um, and therefore not require the, the simulation, but it, it use the simulation as a learning exercise. And finally, moving on to the implications of NCAP. So NCAP needs to adapt to ensure that the customer is able to understand the differences in functionality. Um, and that's because the core ethos of NCAP at the moment is that it allows customers to understand the level of safety equipment that is fitted to a vehicle or, or how safe a vehicle is. Um, with GSR2 mandating the fitment of some of these ADAS features which would previously score NCAP points, um, that leads to effectively NCAP staying the same and all vehicles having a, a baseline. Um, examples of this are for AEB or the emergency lane keeping assistance systems uh, and also intelligence speed assist. So these are all features which you can score NCAP points for. Um, so the question is when these features are mandated how does NCAP remain relevant? Um, one of the ways that NCAP could do this is by grading performance over and above the mandatory requirements. So this is almost instilling the compliance is not enough. Um, if you want to gain the benefit of, of five-star NCAP, you need to exceed the mandatory requirements and, and perhaps have um, a range of uh, increased speed range for AEB um, where it has to avoid a collision, for example, over and above where GSR2 would mandate, um, because that means then the vehicle should be safer and it's doing more than what the minimum requirement is. 
Um, there's also uh, an opportunity, and this is something that, that NCAP uh, are already discussing, is adding um, points for V2X services, but scoring additional points for these V2X services and perhaps integrating those with the features um, that, that are already on the vehicle. So as an example, um, if for your intelligent speed assist and you use V2X, um, awarding points for that element because your system is likely to be more robust and correct, um, especially when it comes to identifying variable speed limits um, in overhead gantries, which currently use a, a camera, um, the, the V2X increases the robust, robustness of that massively. So there's an opportunity to, to demonstrate that, that your system is even better than what is required. Um, and, and that's the way that I think NCAP will need to adapt. Um, in order to <clears throat> in order to stay uh, to stay relevant and provide benefit to uh, to the customers so in conclusion I uh, just want to draw out some some key messages um, in terms of timing so as we touched on at the beginning phase one it is around the corner um, we're driving in additional complexity um, into vehicles in it within a short time frame. Uh, this is particularly poignant for commercial vehicles um, where ADAS is is relatively new. Um, so, so that's a, an element that we need to factor in. Um, there are also opportunities to be gained within this. Um, so, for example, the multi-pillar testing approach um, that I touched on using this as an opportunity to gain experience with simulation within your validation processes um, where there's a lower risk um, in, in terms of there's already familiarity with the systems um, but also where there uh, the, the simulation as validation isn't required for you to to get to an, a state of engineer a point of engineering sign off. Um, the, the the by getting that experience early on, you are then giving yourself the knowledge um, that when you do need to use multi, the multi pillar approach for more complex systems, you you've got some experience, you've got some data to go on, um, which will overall Im improve um, your ability to to be confident um, that, that the approach that you're taking the process that processes that you've developed are um, correct and appropriate and finally um, just to touch on the point of compliance is not enough again so um, it's recommended that that you go above and beyond compliance to ensure that the, the feature or the system um, will be one which the customer will use and they'll gain benefit from um, the, the key point here is if if you're if you're mandating these systems and the default on to gain the benefit from that they need to be a good user experience um, and not one of those features where the customer or the driver will get into the car and switch that off every time um, and that's important because if they're doing that then we're not achieving or realizing the benefits of gsr2 and the additional safety features that are being put into vehicles so thank you for your time today um if you'd like to talk any more about gsr2 or, or adas and, and cav um please don't hesitate to get in touch. Uh, my contact details are there on the screen. Uh, I'm looking forward to any answering any questions that, that you might have. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. That was a really interesting presentation. Um, not particularly surprising to hear uh, Myra uh, recommending the use of approving grounds to uh, um, uh, validate some of this work. Um, but there are some interesting points that come out from that as well, and I can see some questions coming into the inbox from the audience as well. So please um, submit your questions and we'll work through the questions that, uh, as quickly as we can with, uh, with what we have time for. Um, so Aaron, thank you for your presentation. Um, I think my first question um, would be around which vehicles are in scope for this, because we talk about passenger car, uh, about commercial vehicles as well. 
does this extend to um, to buses, to tractors, to motorbikes, e-scooters? And do you think some of those will start to adopt it in a non-mandatory way as the tech gets cheaper anyway? So uh, I think in terms of buses, yes, um, that, that they fall under the, the heavy commercial um, vehicle category. Um, in terms of motorbikes, e-scooters, um, uh, the technology becoming cheaper is is definitely something that will help. Um, but I think in term the the other the difficulty there is sort of the the, the costs involved will still be still be high. Um, also driving additional complexity and packaging and integration um, challenges onto onto those smaller um, types of vehicle. Um, especially when it comes to, to packaging sensors, ECUs, etc. Um, I think there's also a, a risk with uh, the two-wheeled vehicles um, in terms of if the ADAS system is providing um, motion inputs, uh, it could cause instability in the vehicle, which the driver doesn't expect, um, and therefore that that almost doesn't give you the safety benefit because it, it could pose uh, a greater danger to the driver. And you said um, these features can be overruled by a, a car driver anyway, so uh, the motorbike won't be the last vestige of freedom on our roads then um, for those who want the right to be able to kill themselves. Is, is that true that, that we'll be able to override these features as a, uh, as a user? Yeah, that, so you'll be able to override them so with a steering assistance feature, either putting a, a, a greater steering input above the threshold that, that the manufacturer selects um, with the intelligent speed assist uh, again putting a throttle input and that will be dictated by the manufacturer uh, so no it, it won't be uh, taking the joy out then of driving um, and you can also turn them off so that's a, a key thing within all of the GSR2 regulations um, you have to be able to turn these systems off uh, they do have to default on over the next ignition cycle but you could turn them off every time um, uh, and you do need appropriate warnings to let you know that you've turned the, the system off as well okay um, and the, you talked about this covering the, the generations of type approvals for the new type approvals and then um, becoming a, a requirement for existing types uh, in due course does uh, for the UK particularly does that allow IVA to to escape this requirement Uh, what do you mean by IVA? So the individual vehicle approvals rather than the whole vehicle type approval? Uh, no, so I think uh, it, it, it governs the, the vehicle type, but you will need to do your type approvals for each individual vehicle as well. Um, you, you basically have to satisfy that, that all the vehicles that you sell will, will meet the, the requirements, which I suppose is governed by that high level type approval. Okay. Um, my own question then, does that mean the end of the kit car industry in the UK? There is a limit on production numbers. I can't remember the number off the top of my head, but but you have to produce a certain amount of, of vehicles. So those um, small production ones, uh, I don't believe, are affected. Okay. So, uh, you should still, still get the industry. Uh, it's going to be an interesting mixed space on our road with lots of different technology in due course. Um, so you talked about uh, regulatory validation and that normally involves physical testing, um, but how do we stop that um, inadvertently excluding some technology? So um, are we learning from the USA, for example? So uh, I think one of the, the key elements when discussing the GSR2 uh, <coughs> individual regulations within the working groups has been that, that it needs to remain solution agnostic or at least a variety of solutions need to be available. Um, however, as you said, with, with the, the testing, the testing's um, still prescriptive. Um, so you are guided down particular paths and there may be multiple um, where, you know, um, that, that you, you need to be able to satisfy those criteria. But, but the idea in the development of the regulation is to ensure that there are different options and it is uh, as agnostic as possible. Okay. Um, uh, reminder to the audience, can you uh, submit your questions in the uh, through the, the chat function, please? I'll carry on working through the list. Um, how do we how do we look at homologation where software is being updated overnight? And so the software that may be in the car, even when it's delivered, isn't the software it was homologated with for the 
vehicle uh, for type approval. So I, I think this is is something where OEMs will need to be careful um, that that when they issue these software updates, it, it doesn't affect the system behaviour to a point where the initial sign off is deemed no longer relevant. Um, because if if that's to happen, you would need to then have the the system rubber stamped uh, again to count for the changes that have that have happened. So. Um, that, that also includes retesting, updating documentation, um, and, and re sort of reapproval of that um, to 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 test uh, check the changes, um, which is I think something that you'd really want to avoid because it can it can get very expensive quite quickly. And so, what what level of latitude then is is allowable away from the original calibration, the original um, software pack? before it becomes required for a, a complete uh, recertification. So, so I think the, the key would be in the performance of the system um, and that it doesn't deteriorate um, from, from what you've declared the system will do. Uh, and I think that's got to be where the, the line is drawn. How's that validated? So uh, this is where you, you quite quickly get into sort of muddy water where I don't think these systems will um, be updated via software updates. So that when you issue a software update, you'll ensure that, that the elements that, that needed to be tested for type approval are unaffected because, again, you, you run into these problems quite quickly um, and you increase the risk. That makes sense. Okay, thanks. Um, so do you think as as we move towards vehicles then that are less likely to have a collision, have we got scope to take weight out of those vehicles because we don't need to carry the same crash structures that we required when they were only controlled by the Mark 1 eyeball? So no, I think the, the, the key here is that because they're ADAS features inherently in the name there, assisting the you know the, the driver assistance features the driver still needs to be um in the loop that they're, they're not a fail safe uh they're, they're designed to to help mitigate um and in some instances avoid collision but the the the, the case to take is mitigate the, the effects of of, of a, a collision um so i don't think we can remove that because the eyeballs are still the the key sensor really for the, the driver in their inputs and these are a safety barrier and a safety net around them. Um, I think there's potentially scope to, to look down that avenue once we get to highly automated vehicles, um, particularly sort of level five plus where they're only interacting with other um, autonomous vehicles or um, you've got sufficient V2X to allow all the vehicles to talk to each other and know what's going on, um, which you can then have confidence that the risk of a collision is um, decreased. But but I think ultimately the, the safety um, in terms of structural safety that we have in vehicles is, is paramount um, because being electronic systems, they can fail, they, you know, they, they may not cover all bases. So it, it's certainly something that I wouldn't be keen to, to push as a, uh, something that we reduce our efforts on. And I guess it's it's a question of how much we want to control how people behave, because you talked about um, uh, trying to avoid foreseeable misuse where, um, you know, you might the car tells you you're drowsy and you just ignore it because we arrogantly believe that we are not drowsy um, or that it, it misinterprets um, poor steering inputs. For example, we've all seen the example on the motorway where somebody isn't drowsy, they're halfway through writing a novel into their telephone to to um, discuss their girlfriend with their wife or vice versa. Um, so how how do we uh, stop that kind of misuse where the system has been installed at great expense, but we're not the, the user isn't going to see the value out of it? So uh, again, I think this comes down to whilst it's an ADAS feature, it's a, a driver assist feature, and the, the responsibility firmly lies with the driver. Um, I, I think with the, the misuse cases, um, especially with the introduction of, of SOTIF, manufacturers are now taking, or, or system designers are now are now taking this on board and, and investigating into 
how people may misuse the system um, and, and mitigating for that. Uh, again, this is something that that becomes more important with with high levels of automation where there's a, a blurred line between who's in control of the vehicle um, whether that be the, the driver or the vehicle itself being responsible um, uh, and it's at that point I think that the misuse then becomes important because the responsibility has been taken away from the driver whereas whilst the driver is still responsible um, from a, a regulatory point of view and a legal point of view it, they are still in control and should not be doing, you know, abusing those misuse cases. Um, so, so I think there has to be an element of, of pragmatism and balance between the, the two. And I think as well, it's about the driver seeing the value in that system. Um, and I suppose that links back to uh, avoiding the number of false positives um, to, to make me believe the system is worthwhile. Um, there's an argument that you need a, a very small number of false positives for close calls. To remind you that the system exists, um, but when that when that close call becomes um, dis it discredits the system, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, it do it doesn't take much for a driver to lose lose confidence in a system um, through those uh, false positives, um, which is key to it, which means that, you know, the, the systems do need to be robust. I think although these features are mandated and, and NCAP encourages them, um, that there's still the ability for the driver to turn that system off. So if it isn't a robust system um, or, or, or the performance doesn't meet the driver's requirements, I think for ADAS features generally they should blend into the background and inter intervene when absolutely necessary and the driver recognises that, that that was an appropriate time to intervene and, and is thankful that the, the system's done something. Um, but, but once that confidence is lost and you, drivers then start turning the systems off, you almost lose the benefit um, of them being being regulated, uh, being mandated, or, or or being fitted to the vehicle, um, because once it's off, it, it it's not doing anything, and it takes m a lot more effort for the driver to um, switch it back on again, or, or or get into the habit of leaving it on uh, and regain their confidence in the system, because you you just start reverting back to your previous behaviour. That makes sense. And um, looking towards Europe, then, do you think uh, there'll be any implication? For UK from Brexit, where we move away from uh, mandated formats for road signs, for example. So within with the UK, we're we're still keeping we're still adopting EU type approval, which means we will we'll still need to comply with GSR two because it's for EU type approval. Um, as road signs road signs change, um, I mean it. it, it the signs uh, in the ice, for example, are, are form part of a catalog. Um, I, I think whilst we're still adopting EU type approval um, standards, we need to make sure that, that, that the sign catalogs are updated. Um, whether that means that we need to go to the extent of, of having our own sign catalogs to make sure that, that when you type approve in the UK, it, it still meets um, the, the UK spec. Uh, that, that's another question and um, something that, that that should definitely sort of be considered. Um, but but I think whilst we're still adopting EU type approval, yes, we, we do need to still have that link there to make sure that the systems work, whether you're using them in the UK or, or going across the continent. And thinking about the different testing environments that are available across Europe then, um, has any work been done into checking the repeatability and the reproducibility of the different different EU technical services providing that testing? Because I guess you could get different results from different agencies. And I think this is, is something that's similar to, to what what happens with NCAP at the moment and the way that's mitigated is by having more prescriptive um, test protocols uh, and also there's an element of, of trust in the sort of technical service providers um, keeping that uh, integrity and ensuring they're one providing the standards uh, providing their services to the same standards as required um, um, for the, the test protocol and that, that that's matched across across different um, service providers um, but but that's the I think that's the reason why we, we struggle to get rid of any prescriptive test protocol 
um, uh, but because that's what helps gives a, give us that level of uniformity. And um, there's an interesting question. Um, how will, in the future, how will new and young drivers know what good looks like? So um, uh, a question comes in from somebody who says, talking about um, improving a learner driver's smoothness while using the clutch by teaching cl clutchless gear changes. And I guess in the future, the concept of a clutch will be quite quite alien to, to many drivers. How will we know what, what good looks like? So I, I think that there's a, a level of education, I suppose, and, and people that have been driving for many years before these systems were, were in place have have gradually learnt and seen the increments over the years. Um, I, I think the advantage of being able to turn systems off is that you know you can, you can give a, a young driver an experience of this is with no safety net this is the safety net this is, this is how it feels with the safety net um but i i think from just experience within industry different oems approach these systems in in different ways and they, they all have their own slight differences in character and feel um so that there's already those differences which, which experienced drivers will will pick up on as they drive different different marks of vehicle um so so i think the the element of, of experimentation and, and actually perhaps having young drivers see the difference of, of having those safety nets in place um, as well as not having them at all um, will make them have an appreciation for, for what these features can and can't do much like um, yeah the people that are more experienced have, have just sort of learnt that as they've driven different vehicles and, and progressed with technology over the years. And do you think that means that manufacturers will give a different character to their vehicles so a, a, a Volvo ADA system will feel much more cocooning and protected, whereas a Lotus ADA system will have very late interventions and a much more aggressive uh, approach. Yeah, I think that that's already in place, um, to be honest. Uh, so I, I think that's how OEMs were able to differentiate themselves, as you said, with, with Volvo sort of safety being paramount um, compared to a, a more sporty drive, for example, where you know you want the system to feel like it's interfering less, but but still there as a safety net in that that last possible moment so that there, there already is a difference uh, and i think that will continue um so we got a question from somebody who's working on uh, active safety active safety systems um as part of a university um and talking about um systems and future upgrades to prevent vehicle occupants opening doors into um cyclists for example um some manufacturers have their own warning systems and uh, our questioner is working on a system that actively stops a door being opened. Do you think there are, are additions and uh, that will be brought onto systems, and is that kind of thing that that NCAP will reward? So, so I think that's where the opportunity for for NCAP to adapt um, and reward for for other systems which are no longer mandated. Um, you know that that's where their opportunity is and i i think that's that's where the, the direction that they will go in um the types of systems uh you know i i think that's up for discussion um but but as we've seen with the the gsr2 sort of implementation um that there may become a point where those systems as they become more um you know widespread within the industry uh, do become mandated um in a few years time as the technology moves um i mean ncap have been providing points for for aeb and, and traffic sign recognition etc for for quite some years now so it, it does take time for them to become get to that point of becoming mandated um so so i think i, I think that's generally where i would see the the, the industry move or NCAP moving uh, towards as well. Yeah, I agree. Okay, uh, we've got uh, just a few minutes left, so we've got time for a few more questions. Um, in simulation and modeling, um, this leads into the codes used and the model standards and so on. Um, is the approach to, for example, pedestrian head impact using CAE, CAE as a guide to, for where to test a bonnet, how much is that, that test process driving the design and, and does it represent the, the full latitude we see in the real world? So, so I think the advantage of simulation um, it is that you can test a, a 
broad number of edge cases very quickly and, and understand. But in order to make sure that you know you, you've got confidence that what you've seen in the simulation is reflective of real world, um, probably not in the the example of a pedestrian and VRU unless you've got you know unless you're doing it in a crash lab. Um, but but to correlate those results is. <laughs> Is important um, because then you you know that the, the simulation you've done in your design um, it is actually representative of the real world. So you've got confidence that all of those edge cases that you've done in simulation are actually um, it, the results are actually accurate and a representation of what you'd expect in the real world. Obviously, it takes the benefit out if you test everything in the real world. But there, there's, a, there's multiple cases where you can't um, do tests in the real world, but but you've got enough data with your simulation being accurate um, that, that you, you're confident that the system if it came across that uh, event would react appropriately we've seen a, a similar real world question from a couple of um, people in the audience actually um, what is the requirement on highways agency to produce adequate road marking so that lane assist systems don't try and throw you into a ditch um, rather than uh, helping you and I've seen that issue particularly in roadworks where um, the the permanent road lane markings aren't obscured or they look different in sunlight or whatever um, and you don't then naturally follow the the roadworks lanes um, and potentially the car is is not just not just neutral but it's actually trying to kill you so so on that one I, I, yeah you're absolutely right you know you, you do see issues in the real world and I think that's where the the Going above and beyond compliance is, is such a, a key aspect um, because you may pass the tests on a, a proving ground or in a controlled environment where they're prescriptive and the, the lane markings are perfect because it, that that's the, the nature of a, a sign-off test. But going out into the real world and even doing um, some uh, subjective drives at the end um, helps because it, it gives you confidence that if your your system comes across uh, you know different situations and and degraded line markings it, it will still cope and that your customers will be satisfied um, because the risk is you you release a system which is compliant um, and then you uh, you know customers start using it in the real world it, it doesn't behave as it, it should therefore they they turn it off or um, or they they complain to the manufacturer and they, they lose confidence in in that brand of vehicle um, so you know I, I, I think that's where the uh, as I spoke about in the presentation um, that the driver of making sure real world performance is, it isn't affected when you make when, when you're doing the compliance updates it, it is a key key factor um, but um, it, it does definitely have some onus on Highways England because you know uh, the, the system can only do so much with, with the surroundings that it, it's given yes no, that makes sense and on that then, as as manufacturers go beyond what is mandated, then presumably that will feed back into what becomes mandated in the future. Um, when do you think uh, things like biometric monitoring systems for for heart attacks or picking up when you're you're an angry driver? Um, when does that move away from being a, a you know a nice add-on that gives N, NCAP give extra points for? And when does that become mandated to say I don't want drivers who are having heart attacks? I think one of the the key things there is when the technology becomes widely adopted and the the, the costs reduced, so that you know the, these things tend to start in your premium vehicles um, and filter down. It, it takes many years for that to happen. Um, so so I think that you know with the biometric example, where with the the driver drowsiness um, and attention warning, we, we've got the inference through steering inputs and then in a couple of years time GSR2 mandates that you'll need to have the advanced version which, which is actively monitoring the driver through a camera for example um, uh, and then the next step from there would be the biometric so there is already that evolution but but I think it it, it needs the technology to be implemented more widely um, so that it it doesn't impact the um, higher volume sort of lower cost manufacturers um, where those margins are, are, are tighter um, 
because it, it will affect them the most in in having to you know have, drive additional complexity and cost into vehicles which which they're not factored in for so i think there's a, there's a real balance to be struck between mandating um and making sure that the technology is at a point where it can be readily adopted that makes sense um i think we've got time for one more question um do you think uh, and this this is a concern that came up um, previous generations where we began wind tunnel testing cars and there was a concern that all the cars would end up looking the same. Um, do you think the, the requirements for vehicle design in terms of crashworthiness, pedestrian safety and then packaging this suite of sensors is going to start driving cars to converge to a single answer in terms of what the, the car must look like to meet these regulations in the same way that we've seen F1 cars, uh, arguably? Uh, become looking very similar and we, we no longer have scope for a, a six-wheel Tyrrell or anything like that. Do you think cars will go the same direction to um, generate that same suite of sensors because they're all buying them off the same suppliers? No, I, I, I don't see them, them going that way in that the, the sensors do need to be implemented. In, and as we see today, you know, vehicles have all of the these the same sensors on them um, to deliver these systems, but they still keep their own design language. I think what we might see is, as cars become more automated is the the packaging to, or the layouts changing um, to, to factor in that the, pe the, the occupants will be being driven rather than doing the driving. Um, so, you know, I think you see it with the autonomous pods. They all tend to look fairly similar. Um, but, but whilst there's still an element of minimizing um well, well the driver still having to do the driving um I, I think you can still have that that character from each oem um and, and it may be a, you know a, a different face on the vehicle but but i think the depending on the the use of the vehicle um but we'll sort of, or the, yeah the, the use of the vehicle will sort of dictate how that looks as i said with the pods they, they tend to look quite similar but but whilst the, there's still a driver focus i think you can still have that individuality between brands um that we see today i think i'd argue that by the time you remove the requirement for the driver as well i've seen some really exciting things done with with buses and minibuses where it looks more like a branch of ikea or costa coffee than it does a a vehicle as we would know it today so i think that that may give us more latitude in the future okay i'm conscious we're over time um aaron that has been a really fantastic presentation thank you it's great to see your your depth of knowledge and the insight and the the expertise that myra is bringing to the to the industry as well so at this point we would normally all clap and uh clap stand and uh, uh express our gratitude but we cannot so um i will just say thank you very much uh for attending this uh INACI event and please keep an eye on the events page for uh, more events coming up. Thank you.